Let me start at the beginning. In uh, 1969, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote uh, an extraordinary book um, on death and dying, uh, which has been of value and of uh, service to millions of people around the world um, who've suffered bereavement or loss of a, of a close one. Um, she's a Swiss psychologist, and she has spent, uh, she spent her life dedicated to, to helping uh, people who suffer bereavement, um, very often children. And in this book, uh, she has uh, set out five stages of grieving, five uh, aspects of, of grief that are common to uh, all of the humanity, all the people that she's met. And in subsequent years and in um, the, the, the books that have been written uh, by her and by others since then, these five stages of grieving have continued to be visible and to have emerged and to seem to be in some way um, uh, some kind of basic model of human behavior, some natural response to, to that, that sad but inevitability. Um, and as I looked at this, and I had reason to look again recently at these five stages, I, 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 something struck me about them, which is that, as uh, John said, I've spent the last 20 years of my life exploring uh, how to help the music industry deal with the tsunami of the internet. Uh, and how to accommodate itself to that. And I, I don't claim to have been very successful in doing that, I have to say, but I have, in the process, um, observed and experienced the reaction of, a, of an industry uh, in the face of that kind of uh, dramatic change. And it struck me as I looked at this list, um, and, 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 and here are the, uh, the, the five stages, as I looked at that list that they seemed incredibly familiar to me, that they seemed like the kinds of behaviors that I'd actually encountered in the business world. And I thought this was curious and, and fascinating. And I'm not sure if I know exactly what that means yet or how to respond to it. But I thought that I would take you through the recognition that I had of those stages and to help you perhaps uh, help me understand what that might mean. But there is a sense somehow or other that perhaps, I think, uh, that what we all feel as individuals may also actually be true for businesses and for companies, uh, for whole industries, and maybe even for whole sectors. And I don't quite know what the implications of that are, but I'm fascinated by it, and I think there's something there that I want to pursue. So let me take you back to the, uh, the first days of the, of, of the internet and the, and the first period of, of, uh, of the, uh, the first wave of the tsunami. Um, and there were three businesses that were launched uh, in those uh, very early, very exciting years. MP3.com was the first uh, site to basically allow you to download all of the music was there, that was there. That was its ambition, was to be the iTunes that we now know. Um, it was launched um, in 97 by a man called Michael Robertson, who lives in San Diego, who was an incredible pioneer, an incredible passionate believer in the opportunities and the new. Uh, the next little uh, rather poor image, I'm sorry I couldn't find a better image, but it's a, a not, a, not a product that's available anymore, but is, that's a picture of the Diamond Rio. And the Diamond Rio was the first MP3 player ever produced commercially. And it was, by today's standard, it was a really clunky beast, but at the time it was the coolest device that you could be seen carrying around you in downtown LA. Um, and the, finally, in the, the, the logo you might recognize at the bottom was the logo of Napster. And Napster was the first uh, site uh, that allowed file sharing, that allowed the possibility that every single piece of music in the world might be available to every single person in the world for free. So those three innovations in that period of time were some of the scariest things that the music industry had seen coming at it. But if we think about their response to it, not in terms of their being afraid of change, but actually they're denying the fact that the old model had died and that these were the tokens of the after, what came after that life, then their response starts to be a bit more understandable and you can perhaps see it in it more because what they did was they responded by denying that it was happening. They basically put their heads in the sand. They said, no, this stuff doesn't matter, it's not important, we don't need to know about it, and in our terms, we're not going to license it. We're not going to give you any music to put on mp3.com from our major record label libraries, and we're not going to put it on the Diamond Rio, and we're not going to put it on Napster either. And if any of you try and do anything about that, sorry, not important, don't want to know. Well, all of us know that in the next few years that followed, it was very hard for them to keep that kind of denial, for them to keep their heads in the sand, to behave in that kind of ostrich-like fashion, and believe that 
their old model was still alive. By 2000, uh, Napster was on the front page of Time magazine. And you had to be more than just blind and an ostrich not to know what was going on in the world. And that notion of denial was no longer an appropriate one. It was no longer an appropriate reaction to think about our old model and still believe that it was alive when it was quite clear that something very new and very, very big was going on. So let's go back to Kubler-Ross. What was the next thing that she said would happen? Well, the next thing that happens after you've realized that denial is no longer an acceptable response to the death of a loved one, then your response is to be angry. And that's just, as we know, a lot of people who have um, friends who've died in hospital, um, a lot of natural response is to try and sue the doctors who should have done something to protect them, who should have done something to keep them alive. And it wasn't that you know, their illness was terminal, it wasn't that they were very ill, it was that the doctors were wrong. And we've, we all, I think, have heard that and know that response. Well, what does that mean in this term, in industry terms? Well, that means litigation. Each of those companies was sued uh, in the years that followed uh, by the RIAA and by the different record companies. So their response to knowing that their business model was dead was to try and sue the people that they thought were to blame because they were, should be, they were angry at them, they had an anger about it, and where were they going to do that? They were going to displace it onto those people. Now, fortunately uh, for us all, uh, the suit against the, Ryman, the, the Diamond Rio was unsuccessful, but it took a long time for it to be unsuccessful. It went through the courts for years and years and years. Unfortunately, it's led, of course, it's a, the, the failure of that lawsuit meant that today we, we can all enjoy the iPod and all the other various MP3 players that are out there. Um, MP3.com was not, uh, not so fortunate, it was closed down, and Napster was closed down as well. Once, once anger has diffused, and there's a recognition that, that anger is no longer the emotion. The next one down on that list, and without referring back to it, I'll just remind you what it was, um, is bargaining. I'll do something if this goes away. If, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. They don't have to be dead. It doesn't have to be the end of that business model. If I do something else about it, what do I do about it? Well, I try and control the situation again. So I'll try and buy you. So in 2001, after the lawsuit and all the, all the litigation was out of the way, both of those companies were acquired. It was a kind of control. It was like, I can still keep breathing life into my old model. I can still carry on with my own business and I'll control this new stuff. I'll buy it because I've got loads of money. It doesn't matter to me. I'll buy it. So as we know, mp3.com did carry on for quite some time. It was sold on to CNET, and I think it still exists in some vestigial form, and Napster still continues to this day. But what happened then, which was interesting, and I hadn't really thought about this until I, until I really started to, to pursue it a bit, was, of course, that technology moves very fast. And so there was another wave of technology that came along after this first set of activities. And what I discovered was that the cycle then starts to repeat itself. So the next wave of technology that came along was file sharing, big time, all right? So what response was there to file sharing? Anger. And who to sue? Well, who do you think? There's only really one bunch of people that you could really focus on and get really angry about with file sharing. Consumers. There are lots of them. And in 2003, the RIAA initiated beginning of a campaign of litigation that extended to 30,000 individuals, and that campaign is continuing to this day. There are lawsuits continuing. Quite incredible. The really extraordinary thing is not only did they pursue the elderly children, they also pursued people who were dead. I don't know quite what to make about that. But that wasn't the bit that was, that was dead here. What was clearly dead was their old business, and everything that they were doing was trying to think about reasons why the technology was to blame for the death of the old model, even though there were all sorts of other things that they'd been doing or failing to do that were just as, as accountable and just as meaningful for the reasons of the death of sale of CDs, the death of the sale by the unit, and, and the, the corporatization that had gone on through the, the 80s and the 90s. So what else happened? What else happened in that period? Well. Uh, after having tried to sue consumers, 
didn't stop there because there were other people that you could try and sue. And the obvious other people to try and sue uh, were the network operators themselves, the guys who were actually serving this stuff up, although, of course, they weren't actually serving it up, so it was a bit difficult to understand. But they sued them too. So Kazar got, got shut down after a very protracted lawsuit. Uh, LimeWire is still running, but is the subject of a lawsuit from four of the major record companies today. And as we know, the Pirate Bay was the subject of a major lawsuit just last year, and the Pirate Bay company itself was closed down, even though the BitTorrent network that it fed into is continuing. And this is, in a sense, is the absurdity of the situation. Because on the one hand, uh, that there is nothing in any of this that actually really protects the old model, because there's nothing you can do when, the, when it's dead, it's dead. And you can protest and do all this stuff as much as you like, but it's not going to help breathe life back into what you've lost. But there's something else in this as well that I want to get to. But there were a couple of other things that happened. So the next thing that happened, having, having fired off lawsuits at consumers, having fired off lawsuits and closed down network operators, who else was there? Well, there was some, what other pe bunch of people to do? And those, those were the networks themselves, the ISPs. So in a famous case, and, and this is a headline from the register, and I, I only put this up because I love the, head, the, the register's masthead, which says, biting the hand that feeds it, which is just such a great, great slogan. Uh, what they tried to do, the BPI and here in the UK, was to make agreements with the ISPs that they would actually go after their own customers and tell them to stop doing this stuff that the BPI didn't want them to do. And they came up with this incredible arrangement where uh, they would send letters out um, and there would be this proposal that there would be what they call a graduated response. So the letters would get nastier and nastier until eventually they'd get the ISPs to turn them off. As we stand today, there are proposals in the UK parli Parliament and in the French Parliament proposing precisely that remedy. So we, this hasn't stopped, this hasn't gone away. I'm not, you know, I started off in the early history, but actually it, the, the cycle continues. And that's, that's up to the present day. So what do we, what, how do we just sort of draw some, some sense of this? What do, we, what do we make of this? And what's actually going on in the broader picture? One of the things that becomes very obvious is that when you think about the, the, the ecology of all the companies in the creative space, and in, in the case of music, all the different sorts of entities in music that are, uh, relate to artists, relate to record labels, if you kill off, or if one piece of it dies, then all the relationships start to change. So you make a difference, uh, I've missed a little bit here, but if you make a difference to one piece of your ecology, then all the other pieces of it start to, make a diff make, start to change. So let's just see and talk a little bit about that. This picture here is a very, very stylized um, picture of the cozy old world of the record companies, where the record companies sat in splendid magnificence in the heart of everything, with all of the other people dancing around them in attendance, with the different relationships that they had at work, until, of course, the change happened. And then the CD market suddenly started to decline. And then it was that artists started to come to be the middle of the frame of things, and labels started to move aside because the live scene started to grow enormously. And things like iTunes and YouTube became incredibly important. And new players started to come on the scene who became very, very critical to like Facebook and Spotify, Last FM. MySpace is now probably one of the most important websites for music. And all sorts of interesting new players emerging, like Hype Machine and SoundCloud. And right up there, still unresolved, hovering in the corner, the ISPs with this extraordinary role in relation to the music scene. And what you know is that what's true for music is probably true for other sectors as well. And although the relationships are different, although the, the nature of the change is different, you can be sure that actually in every single one of the sectors that neighbors music, similar kinds of transformations are taking place. And right at the heart of it, right at the heart of it, is the change from a sale of units to a change that's a sale about a relationship and to something which actually is focused on what we're now calling social media. So how do we make sense of any of this? And how do we, you know, is this analogy that I'm drawing useful and does it mean anything? If in the end, I think what it, it's about is about recognizing that actually in the face of change or in the face of the, the death of a business model, there are a number of different elements at work. And it's very easy and it's very clear that the sorts of responses that we're seeing at the corporate level are not different from the responses that individuals have. And that 
we've, we've read in all kinds of places, and we know uh, through scientific discovery the extent to which what is true in the very small can also be true in the very large. And this might be another case where that's true. So well, I look back and I try to figure out, well, what's, what's going on in, in, uh, when we think about uh, the emotion involved, and we think about the sort of the personal human emotion that is in, innate in this response, can we, draw any, can we see any other work that's been done? Can we see any other learning that has been done? And, and someone who's, who's spoken at TED on a number of occasions and someone who uh, has looked into this very deeply uh, is Daniel Goleman. And uh, his work on emotional intelligence has been very focused on actually the, the, the role of the individual. So it, his work has all been about saying, you know, when you hire somebody, it's a good idea if you try and figure out what, how emotionally literate they are as well as whether they're any good at the job. Because they could be brilliant, absolutely brilliant operators, but if they rub everybody else up the wrong way, then you don't necessarily want them on your team. So his focus for emotional intelligence was very much about how does the individual fit into the team. But I think where, where I'm going with this, and, and, and as I say, this is very fresh thinking, so I, I can't say that I've, I've given this the depth that I would like to do over time. But it seems to me that there is a very human element to the way in which corporations behave, and that in a way that's blindingly obvious, but in another way, in every way in which they speak and every way in which they express themselves, companies don't talk about their humanity, they talk about their rationality, and they talk about their objective business targets, strategies, and focus, and they don't talk about the emotional responses that they have to the things that go on around them. And yet, as we've just seen, their behaviors mirror absolutely individual emotional responses to circumstances. So the final stage uh, of the grieving process, according to Kubler-Ross's schema, um, is acceptance, is some kind of being at peace with what's happened and, and being able to move on. Um, very recently, uh, we saw an announcement from Universal Music uh, that they were going to tie up with Virgin Media and they were going to produce uh, a new service, a service which in many ways is radical, in many ways is unprecedented to offer people for a single subscription all the music they want, as many downloads as they want. And that might just be an indicator that they might just be beginning to accept what's happened and start thinking about the future. But it might also just be bargaining. Because nobody else has joined this service yet, so none of the other labels have signed up to it, and the service itself has yet to launch. So we'll see, and I don't know what the answer to that one is, and we'll all find out over the next few months what the truth of that one will be. But where does that then leave us, and how do I, what, what, what broader thought is there about this that we can have? And it seems to me that, that there is something here about recognizing our, the extent to which our humanity actually exists within the broader pieces of work that we do. And that when we act collectively, what each of us feels individually transmits itself into that activity. And that actually to ignore that, particularly to ignore it in music, is actually a kind of dishonesty. And when you think about what music's about, and you think about what the relationships that music thrives on are all about, and I think this is probably true for many creative industries, it's about a relationship between an artist and a, and a fan. And it's about the purity and the reality of that relationship. And the reason why that old model of selling CDs and selling music by the unit might have died, maybe, was because actually it had become so corporatized and so sanitized that it no longer had a sense of authenticity. Because let's be clear about this, the amount of money that people are spending on music hasn't actually declined. The numbers of people going to see live gigs has gone up. And the cost of us ticket for a live concert is much higher than the cost of a CD. But why, why do they want to do that? Because of the authenticity, because of the directness, because of the transparency and the immediacy of the relationship. So I think there's something very compelling about that. And I'll give you one other example where, uh, which struck me that, that connects with this, which is that the headquarters of Sony Music, the Sony Corporation uh, of America, is on Madison Avenue. And it's the most enormous building, as they all are on Madison Avenue. And when you walk in there, you feel about this high. You feel completely diminished. And it's double height ceilings. And you go up to the desk and they say, yeah, I've got a meeting with so-and-so. They say, OK, take the elevator to the third floor, Mr. Silver. And you get in the elevator and it's double height ceilings. And you just feel like an ant. If you're very lucky, 
And if you're treated like a real star or you're an artist, you get to go to the top floor where the Sony Club is. And the Sony Club has a window in it that overlooks the atrium where everybody comes in. And when you look down at all the people that are coming in, they all look like ants and you feel like a god. And that, that failure to realize that actually they're people like you and that you're not a god is perhaps the corporatization effect, the, the, the sense of changing you into something that you're not, the, the opacity and the, and the sense that there's no transparent, re, transparent relationship between you and your audience that actually is destroying what they were about. So I don't know where else this goes, but I do think that the more emotional honesty we have and the more transparency in when there is a commercial transaction that we have, the more growth we're likely to see. Thank you very much.